remember at the time when it was actually happening, most of the feedback we were getting still was Picard and Kirk, Riker isn't Spock, or Data isn't Spock, or whoever isn't whoever, but the holy trinity of Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, where are they? Because we like those guys, and these guys ain't making it. So we weren't getting like, this is all in hindsight that this was the year that it all turned around. I wish people had been telling us that when it was happening. We might have actually, you know, had a slightly better time. Maybe we all went to jump ship at the end of the year. It was all happening so fast. We were so behind. It was all coming out of fear, you know, of making the schedule and not having to shut down. And, and, and so you couldn't stand back and go, oh, so this is how it's happening. So through all this pain and, and fear, it's gonna become the season that people are going to remember as the season where it all got good. No, never in a million years are we thinking like that. I was a huge fan of the original series, so I was I, great anticipation for you know for the for the new show, and there was a lot I loved about it. Uh, obviously, I kept watching. I think what kept me watching was was um, Patrick Stewart. What is he? A machine? Is he? Are you sure? Yes. You see, he's met two of your three criteria for sentience. So what if he meets the third? Consciousness in even the smallest degree. What is he then? I don't know. Do you? Do you? I thought it was a very smart choice to make him so different from Captain Kirk, you know, from William Shatner, to make him a, uh, more grown up, and of course, being English, and he has this, you know, this incredible voice. What I'm going to say may sound unscientific, but standing on this soil, breathing in this air, my instincts tell me that we may have got them wrong. Obviously, the effects were, were so much updated from the original series, but the show, it seemed to me, suffered a little bit from being in love with the, its own mythology uh, of, of the original Star Trek, you know, and I think there were so many insiders, uh, perhaps, and this is speculation on my part, who, who had such a reverence for the franchise and what it could be. You seem to find no tranquility in anything. You struggle against the inevitable. You thrive on conflict. Some of the storytelling in the early going suffered from that sort of allegorical, you know, we go to the planet where they do things this way and we either teach them the error of their ways or they teach us something about the error of our ways. They hired Michael Pillar to come on board. Michael took his writing and his supervising of writing extremely seriously. Uh, not to say that other people uh, take what they do for living flippantly, uh, but he was a very serious man. You know, we would be there to hear pitches together. I usually took the notes for the pitches because I was the only girl on the show and that sort of fell to me. But I have to be honest, I think the person who gave us the most guidance and direction was Ira Baer, who was the co-executive producer under Michael Pillar. Michael Pillar spent a lot of time rewriting us and Ira spent a lot of time breaking stories with us. When I joined the staff, the staff consisted of Michael as the showrunner, though I don't even know if we called it showrunner in those days. I think it was just executive producer. Hans Beimler and Ricky Manning, who worked as a team who I knew from fame. And they were pretty bitter at that point because they were real fans and it was tough to be a fan. Part of it was that, especially Rick and Hans and I grew up on Star Trek and we knew and loved Star Trek. Ira knew it not quite as passionately as we did. But then a lot of the other people Star Trek wasn't part of their world. I mean, they hadn't grown up on it. They hadn't lived it. They hadn't pretended to be Mr. Spock, you know, or Kirk or something when they were little kids. And we all had. So I, I think that was also a, a separation. Melinda Snodgrass, who was very talented, wrote Measure of a Man in second season, I think, which terrific episode. But she also, she, Ricky, and Hans were very close when I got there. So they were three people who just fed off each other's, you know, stress 
and disappointment. Gene, I think to some degree, Next Generation had, he had begun to realize that he had in fact created a mythos and he had created a universe that needed to have more power than I'm just making an entertaining hour of television. Data is a valued member of my crew. He is an outstanding bridge officer. If I am permitted to make this experiment, the horizons for human achievements become boundless. When you're worried about message, that's a real tension, you know. I think messages have to be buried, you know, down in this G story, you know, line. They have to be so far down and not up front. What are these? My medals. Why do you pack them? What logical purpose do they serve? I do not know, sir. I suppose none. I just wanted them. Is that vanity? We should be able to illuminate those stories because of what's happening at the top level of the script without getting into it. A single data, and forgive me, Commander, is a curiosity. A wonder even, but thousands of data. Isn't that becoming a race? But there was such a need to keep it um, important, I guess. I had a very interesting relationship with all of the writers, simply because I was the final arbiter of what went on, and I gave a lot of notes. And some of my notes were quite broad, and some of my notes were quite picky. Maybe, maybe in retrospect, a little bit too picky. Guy walks into the doctor's office. The doctor tells him you need an operation. The guy says, I want a second opinion. The doctor says, okay, you're ugly too, but on boom. Rick was deeply uncomfortable with humor. In, to my mind, I mean, it felt like a lot of the humor in scripts would kind of be the first thing that got scrubbed out in the notes. Being able to make people laugh or being able to laugh is not the end all and be all of being human. No, but there is nothing more uniquely human. And if you look at the old show, there were some very funny moments. I know, very charming, very amusing moments. Rick was very different than Michael. You know, Rick um, uh, was also studio executive, came at the project from a different angle. And Rick was sort of, you know, once, as Gene faded away from the show and then ultimately passed away, and then it became really Rick's show from that point, he was the final word. We never got studio notes and there was no network. The final word on anything we were doing came out of Rick Berman's office. And as a consequence, then he became like the guy that we got to get past, you know, to get these ideas passed. Michael Pillar and whoever had written a specific script would come to my office after I had read the script and would get notes. And it would make the writers crazy, as you might guess. Sometimes uh, it would lead to, uh, to arguments about what could get done and what couldn't get done. The thing I did discover about television is that it's like laying track for a train that's about 25 feet behind you, and you're just frantically wanging away on it. But sometimes that kind of drive can make it very immediate and very passionate if you're permitted to make it passionate. I mean, there was one point, Ricky and Hans and I pleaded, begged, both Rick and Michael Pillar, to let us do a return to the piece of the action. We kept saying, it's a natural. We'll get coverage, we'll get, it would just be, and, and you know, we can have people there, they're wandering around pretending to be Kirk and, you know, wearing fake ears. And I mean, it would have been so much fun. And the response was, well, that's just silly. Because they didn't get it. They didn't understand that that would have just made that would have made the viewers so, the fans would have been so happy if they could have seen that. To see what happened when McCoy left his, his, his communicator. I understand that they were afraid to hire, you know, fangirls and fanboys who wouldn't do the work and wouldn't be professional. But then when they had people who were professional, because there's, you know, Ricky and Hans and Ira were marvelous writers and very professional producers, they could still be fans. It didn't mean that we, we would instantly lose our minds and start squeeing and going squee and you know, Star Trek and forget how to how to write. But we would have honored what made Star Trek Star Trek. I think Rick he wasn't looking at it as a show about family. The Hart building to the Cooper building, which were right across the street from each other, uh, it was always a little bit of a, a death march for a lot of the writers to come walking over and uh, sometime 
uh, to have their scripts sort of semi-eviscerated by me. And the closest thing to trying to create a family was data. Why did you do that? You appeared to need it. Who was the child that occasionally they would all try to say, oh, you're discovering this. Let me help you with that. Among humans, a kiss usually serves to seal a friendship or indicates support, attraction, affection. In this context, I must assume that your intention was to express support. You really don't understand human behavior, do you? That is something of an understatement. I, I had no problem with Michael's philosophy of, of letting people submit scripts because I had nothing to do with it. Uh, he had people that read the scripts for him. He read the scripts. Uh, when they were good, he would meet with the writers. He would have them do something else. If they were really good, he, they would get a, uh, the ability to write an episode but not be on staff. Uh, if they worked, they would then uh, enter the staff as a staff writer, which was the, the lowest level. I'd been knocking around in New York City for a couple years after graduating from college, doing theater, that sort of thing, in, in basements of cafes. And, <laughs> you know, there was usually more, more, more of us on stage than there were in the audience, uh, and waiting tables and that sort of thing. And I started writing spec strips. I was in Los Angeles trying to be a writer, and I came to L.A. in 1986. And I remember walking across the street from my apartment and going to the gas station and getting Daily Variety and Hollywood Reporter were on the newsstand, and I would kind of go in and sort of understand what the business is about. And I remember that there was a headline that said, new Star Trek series or, you know, Trek beams back or something. And I was like, what? And picked it up, and that was the first time I realized that, you know, there was going to be a next generation. And I was really blown away and excited because I was a fan of the original series since I was a child and all the movies and this was like a big, big thing. I was a huge fan of the original series growing up and when Next Generation came out I was naturally very curious to see, especially knowing that Gene Roddenberry was actually involved, uh, what it was going to be like and, um, you know, and that sort of dovetailed with my own ambitions to be a writer. Well, I was trying to be a writer in LA and I had a ver variety of jobs. I was a messenger, I was a title insurance guy, I uh, did contract administration, I worked in an animal hospital, and uh, one day I started dating this girl who has a name, whose name is Becca, and um, she had a contact at Star Trek The Next Generation because she had helped, she was an assistant to the casting director and still knew people over there. And she found out that I was a fan of the original show because I had Captain Kirk posters in my apartment. And she said, you know, I could probably get you a tour of the sets. And I started writing spec strips um, and sending them to Paramount Pictures, Los Angeles. Um, I didn't know how things worked in those days. And it took uh, about six weeks or so to set it up. And then it was on the books. And she said, OK, you know, on this day, you can go and you'll get to tour the Star Trek sets. And I just decided that I was going to take a shot. And I sat down and wrote an episode because I loved the show. I'd always written sort of fan fiction kind of stuff on my own and short stories and dreamed about writing for Star Trek. And here was an opportunity. And I didn't know what I was doing. And I just decided, well, why not? I'll take, I'll bring an episode with me. Part of what motivated me to, to start writing spec scripts was I thought, I just thought this could be done better. <laughs> and, um, my first few scripts certainly weren't any better, and it was a learning curve for me. And I think I probably fell in something into the into that um, reverent sort of trap of of writing stories that were a, about the Enterprise going to the planet of X and learning about about why, you know, um, some metaphoric trap. Captain's log, stardate four three one nine eight point seven. So I wrote the bonding, brought it on the day, and uh, Richard Arnold uh, was giving the set tours. And he gave me the set tour, and I talked to him, and he kind of liked me, and I chatted him up and asked him if he would read my script, and he was like, oh, he rolls his eyes, he's like, you know, we're not supposed to do that. But we, I kept at it and kind of kept chatting him up through the, through the set tour, and he finally sort of relented and said, okay, you know what, I'll, I'll read it, and gave it to him, and he liked it. The explosive device went off. There was no warning. I think a year went by, 
and honestly, my friends were starting to worry about me. I said, Renee, you've got to stop writing Star Trek scripts and sending them to Paramount Pictures, <laughs> you know? I mean, what's the point? You know, I said, no, there's one more. I've got this one more idea about Data having a baby, and my friends, you know, didn't even know who Data was. I was just, you know, alone by myself, in Nanu Nanu, you know? And, uh, and, I, and I did it, I wrote it, and I sent it, and about eight months went by. And I, I have to say, I'd, I'd pretty much given up hope I remember I was sitting in a cafe in the East Village where I lived, and my uh, girlfriend breathlessly came running in. Uh, I was having lunch with a friend and said, Star Trek call, Star Trek call. Wow. Say hello to Counselor Deanna Troy. Hello, Counselor Deanna Troy. How do you do, love? I am functioning within normal parameters. And we all went running back. To the, to the apartment, up the five flights of stairs, and, and you know, I was like, I was so nervous, I, I couldn't believe it. And I, um, I think I had to have a shot of, of scotch to calm myself down or something. It's my mother, Captain, she's alive. What do you want? To take my child down to the planet. I cannot permit that, the boy is my responsibility. And then it sat in the slush pile for about seven months. And Richard would periodically go into the slush pile and kind of bring it to the top of the pile in case anybody went through it, because they were just boxes of scripts that nobody had asked them for. And I had this sort of strange belief that I was going to sell that script. I, I was just sort of convinced that I was selling that script for no reason whatsoever. And I just had all these dreams that it was going to happen, it was going to happen. And I remember those seven months, I was, any day now that phone's going to ring and they're going to buy my script. You know, it was just this naive kind of belief that I was going to do it. And then one day I got that call. Michael Pillar called and said he liked the script and, and was interested in buying it. And would I come down and pitch some other ideas for other, other show episodes? And I was just blown away and amazed. It was an amazing experience to drive onto the Paramount lot for the first time. To give my name at the Paramount lot and drive through the same gate that Nora Desmond drove through and, and park and walk to hold the old Hart building, which was a building from, you know, from the early days of the studio. Creaky old building. So sweet. So What does that mean? It honors the memory of our mothers. We have bonded, and our families are stronger. So ski, bad luck, so. I remember going in to the offices, to Michael Pillar's office in the Hart Building, and pitching to the third season writing staff that was all sort of there to hear my pitches. And I had a whole bunch of them on a little yellow pad and went through them one by one. Um, none of which they bought, but I remember at the very end, uh, Hans Beimler sitting on the couch just looked up and said, I want to hear the next five. And they all kind of laughed and they kind of liked me and I kind of liked them and it went really well. And Michael asked me to come back again sometime with some more ideas. You have taken on quite a responsibility, Data. To prepare, I have scanned all available literature on parenting. There seems to be much confusion on this issue. It was definitely late in the season, so they were naturally up against it, uh, behind schedule and over budget. And one of the reasons Michael responded to The Offspring is because he saw, wow, this show could save us. You know, this is a bottle show uh, with one guest star and almost no special effects. Um, this show, you know, is a money saver. We could probably even shoot it in one fewer, in, in, in seven days instead of eight, or maybe even six days instead of eight and they needed that at the time. Data, I am not talking about parenting. I am talking about the extraordinary consequences of creating a new life. Does that not describe becoming a parent, sir? So I'd gone to a second uh, pitch session with Michael and the gang, and we all went to lunch together, and I sold my second one uh, sort of in the moment because they didn't buy any of my ideas that I came formally, and we're just sitting around at lunch, and Michael or Hans or Ira or somebody said something about, you know, I mean, and it's too bad we don't have, don't have a, I always wanted to do a Romulan show. We haven't done a Romulan show yet. And somebody said, yeah, you know, like a Romulan defector or something. And I just jumped in and said, you know, I've been thinking about doing a show with a Romulan defector. Captain's log, Stardate 43462.5. We have beamed aboard an apparent Romulan defector who claims to be a low-ranking logistics officer with extraordinary information about a secret offensive. And I just started, like, just making it up. Uh, this story of a Romulan, there was a, there's a guy and he's an admiral and it's this and who you trust. 
and I just was flying by the seat of my pants and made it up on the spot, not the fully formed show, but enough of a concept that Pillar sort of went, oh, okay, yeah, let's do that. And that's how I sold my second one. You know, we started rebreaking the story, you know, and, and of course this was all new to me, this process, and, 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 I, and I thought, oh, I thought they loved it. Well, I thought that's why I was here, is because they loved it, and, and it sounded like they wanted to change everything. Computer, Lal Gender Sequence finalists, begin. Um, so it was, a, it was a learning experience on that, on that level, and the truth was, we, you know, they only had two afternoons for me, um, and uh, to, to re-break the story, and, and I, I left there. I, I, was, I was told later, after I left, that Ron and, and Hans looked at each other, and Ira looked at each other and shake their head and says, oh, he's toast, <laughs> you know, because we hadn't really rebroken the story. There was a lot of, well, you'll figure it out, and, and it needs to be this, and it needs to be emotional, and it, and it, and it, it can't be what you originally wrote. Um, and, and, and they were right, I was toast. I must accompany you. I commanded the away team. I appreciate your offer, Lieutenant. This is my responsibility. And so then later, when I went down to see the bonding uh, being shot, I was on the set and they, uh, Richard was showing me around and he brought Patrick Stewart over to introduce, him, to introduce me to Patrick. And Patrick came over and he said, oh, this is Ron Moore. He wrote this episode. Oh, marvelous. It's just such a pleasure to meet you. And oh, it's a wonderful script. And I was like, oh, thank you. Thank you. What else are you doing for us? And I said, oh, well, I just, I sold a second one. It's called uh, The Defector, and it's about a Romulan. And I started going to it, and he says, oh, wonderful. Just remember one thing. The captain doesn't do nearly enough screwing and shooting on this show. And then he walked away. <laughs> and that's how I met Patrick. I'll never know love. It is a limitation we must learn to accept, Law. Then why do you still try to emulate humans? What purpose does it serve except to remind you that you are incomplete? I went back. I had two weeks to, re to rewrite the script. I'd never done that before, and and you know I didn't I didn't I didn't pull it off, and um, I thought I did, and I sent it in very eagerly and very proudly and waited for a few days for another magnificent call from Michael Pillar. And when it came, it was Michael's a very very straightforward guy. He said, "Well, I'm very disappointed. Um, you screwed the pooch, um, and we're gonna have to take it over from here." and thank you, goodbye. And I was crushed, as you can imagine. I was so crushed, I didn't even tell my girlfriend or my parents, I didn't tell anybody. I just pretended, oh, well, you know, they liked it. <laughs> uh, we'll see. <clears throat> and I thought, I just got my first big break in this business, and I blew it. And my dream, my Star Trek dreams were over, I thought. The Offspring was uh, a script that I rewrote. Um, and it changed again. I mean, Michael Pillar also took a pass at it. I love you, Father. I wish I could feel it with you. I will feel it for both of us. And they sent me the script, and it was very, very different, but it still had my name on it, you know, which is something I, I still appreciate. Uh, and I know Melinda Snodgrass did a lot of work on it, and I want to thank her if she's watching, for uh, you know for what she did and for and for again for letting my name stay on it. And Michael, of course, did a huge amount of work on it as well. And you know there was just a uh, they built a story on the on the bones of what I had done that was you know much more satisfying and much more emotional. And I could see that when I watched it. I thank you for your sympathy, but she is here. Her presence so enriched my life that I could not allow her to pass into oblivion. So I incorporated her programs back into my own. I have transferred her memories to me. But Michael's edict was that there is no episode of Star Trek that's just about these aliens of the week. Every episode is ultimately about one of our characters on the bridge, and that was sort of his marching orders, and that was the, the big shift. The problem was the execution of that and how to get all the writers to pull and train together. Because we were sort of in a bunker upstairs in the fourth floor of the Hart Building, feeling like, you know, it was us against the world. And Michael was trying to uh, push through his vision of it. Gene uh, was still involved in the show and was throwing out scripts on sort of what we felt were random impulses that he th would just, by edict, say, well, this isn't Star Trek, and you'd go, 
why? You know, he didn't understand or he'd have this, these rules and ideas of what Star Trek was that we fought against and argued. But he was Gene and you could only fight so much. And then Rick was over in the Cooper building and, you know, he was the other big player, but he was kind of removed from us. So it was kind of us and Michael. Michael was not comfortable, especially back then, leading the writer's room. Michael was incapable of lying or being deceptive in any way. He was really bad at playing political stuff with the studio or Rick or actors, and he knew it about himself. And Michael would be the guy that would always say that, you know, at a party, he was the one going to go stand by the potted plant in the corner because he was bad socially. Michael would do things that, at times, would even be detrimental. I remember in the third season, Michael wrote The Memo. Which I begged him not to send. He said, what do you think? Should I send this to the writers? And it was like writing 101. A scene has to have a beginning, middle, and end. He sent it around to the writers. And I remember getting it in my tiny little office. And it was like, how to write for television. I was like, oh, well, I'll, OK, I better read this, you know? Because <laughs> what do I know? I was the first one to read it. And I said, Michael, you cannot do it. You got to sit down. You can say whatever you want. Hey, you're the guy. But you have to look people in the eye and, 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 and tell them, you can't write this in a goddamn memo. You're no longer an executive. We're all in this together. It's a team. You have to be a leader. Don't send this memo. He goes, I'll think about it. He sent the goddamn memo. Meanwhile, down the hall, Hans and Ricky are ready to like quit. And Hans is like storming around his office, enraged, reading from this thing about who is he telling the scenes have a beginning, middle, and end? Oh, really? And he's like throwing, they're so mad. And Ira is like trying to calm the waters, and Melinda's calling her agent, and it, they were so like insulted and infuriated. And from then on, it was over. It was over. The, the, whatever anyone you interview says, the truth is they closed the door on, on Michael for the rest of that season and I had to be the bridge between the two of them. But again, it was Michael's saving grace. It was, he, it was a guileless move. He was just trying to sort of put out sort of his philosophy of, of TV writing and what he knew and what he wanted the show to be about and had no idea that he was really insulting these like professional writers who had done this all their careers. He said, you got, you know, you run the room, you know? And I did. He still had final say, you know, but, but, I, I had to get these cranky, cranky, cranky writers. I mean, Ron was the only one who was so new. He was like, I'm on the good ship Lollipop, and everyone else is saying, you know, I'm walking the plank, you know? <laughs> get me out of here. Michael, he just had moments like that all through the series where he, he, you know, he had started as a network censor, and then he was a, a network studio exec, and those instincts to sort of uh, when there's an issue or a problem to write a memo and distribute it through the building as opposed to bring somebody in and talk to them one-on-one -on -one, got him in trouble because these memos would go out and the memos would be brutal about episodes or writing or you know attitudes in the office or something and you know people would just go crazy i didn't like it to be honest i didn't like being the guy who had to crack the whip and say okay guys okay bitching is going to be over in three more minutes and then we're going to get to work bitch 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 Let's get to work. Uh, and there was a lot of, there was a lot of gallows humor. We laughed a lot in that writer's room just because every script came in, these outside writers' scripts were not good. So it was, uh, and then Mike, in the second half of the season, said, okay, here's how, the only way we're gonna survive this is if we, uh, trade off episodes so i'll be it doesn't mean we're going to write them from scratch but i'm responsible for the script all the way to the finish then you then me then you then me and i'm thinking if that's what you want you know i, I he, he was he was very kind and he was very trusting of me i don't know if i would have been as trusting of me as he was uh and that's how we wound up getting through it